My personal story began when I was 10 years old. I was cut at the age of 10. I was shocked to see a razor blade and I didn't have that time to ask questions. They are three daughters who have never gone through FGM and um, it was really challenging for me to be campaigning against a culture that was believed to be a social norm, something that people really, really... Good evening and welcome to Mtoto News Studios for our very first virtual convening. Good evening and welcome to Mtoto News Studio for our very first virtual convening. My name is Constance Ndeleko and today we'll be speaking on the theme From Cut to Hope. It is estimated that around 2 million girls in the world alive today have, an, have undergone uh, one form of FGM or another globally. It is further estimated that 15 million more girls will undergo FGM by 2030. And these girls are between the ages of 15 and 19 years old, a huge number that we cannot allow to continue. Kenya is home to 4 million girls and women who have experienced FGM. Overall, 21% of girls and women aged between 15 to 49 have undergone the practice, varying from 98% in the north, northeastern region to 1% in the west region. And the overall 21% of the girls and women aged between 15 and 49 have been subjected to the practice. Almost nine in 10 cut women experienced flesh removal, the most common type of FGM in Kenya. The most severe form of FGM in which the vaginal opening is sewn, closed, is practiced among certain ethnic groups and around four in 10 Muslims in Kenya believe the practice is required by the religion. Among some ethnicities, it is a common belief that FGM is required by the community. The prevalence of FGM among adolescent girls has dropped from five in 10 to one in 10 over the last three decades, where Kenya's progress towards abandoning FGM in the past three decades is strong compared to countries in Eastern and, South, and Southern Africa. For this particular convening, we are glad to host our panelist, Matilda Saropa. Matilda Saropa is the co-founder of Naret in Toye, CBO. She is a gender equality advocate and education campaigner based in Kajiado County. Elias Muindi, gender, gender justice activist and a male engagement expert who serves as the program officer for Kenya Men, for Kenya Men Engage Alliance and, under, and an alliance of organization working with men and boys to promote gender equality and women economic empowerment. The third panelist is Kate Thiakunu, an activist, founder of Care Health Providers, a CBO based in Meru County, and a member of the Men and FGM. She is well known for her involvement in justice for Jalida. Her and other activists seek justice for a 14-year-old girl from Meru County who sadly lost her life to the brutality. The fourth panelist is Harrison Lekirio, Harrison Lekirio is um, Harrison Lekirio from Youth Anti-FGM Network, Lekipia County Representative, a male champion against FGM, child marriage, and gender-based violence. I will open the discussion to Matilda, and I will allow her to introduce herself. Welcome, Matilda. Thank you. Yeah, kindly introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Matilda Timpian Saropa. I'm a gender equality advocate an education rights campaigner, and I'm also the co-founder of Naretintoye CBO, a community-based organization that is young women-led and based in Kajado County, Rombo Ward, respectively. We use grassroots interventions to eliminate harmful cultural practices like FGM and child marriage, and we also aim to transform rural communities through tangible projects. Uh, could you kindly um, explain to us what social changes have you made so far in the community, either positive or negative, that have led uh, have created an impact? Yeah, uh, 
uh, we've because we we have three main programs as an, as narrating to you. We have the education program, the economic empowerment program, and the community outreach program. Through the education program, we've managed to sponsor 23 girls who have escaped female genital mutilation, and we also managed to economically empower their families through the economic strengthening program. And we've also been doing community dialogues to reach out to these communities to tell them to abandon FGM practice. So most of the achievements we've been able to do, uh, we've been able to see is improved reporting at the grassroots. Normally in Kajado County, uh, reporting of FGM cases at the grassroots is very minimal, but now there's eyewitness action. We've been involving the duty bearers, the Nyumbakumi policy, the local administrators. Sad sadly, it's the local administrators who are actually behind the scenes supporting child marriage. But now because we are involving them, we are consulting them, even prior mobilization, that it, it, it has isn't our campaigns. And we are now able to see some, some form of change. These women have now improved their livelihoods because basically FGM is coming from a point of poverty. If it is not for poverty, most families will be able to educate their, their children. Through poverty alleviation, they've improved their livelihoods. We highlighted a story of one lady who was an, an ex-cutter, who's an ex-cutter, mm -hmm. and she was telling us that now she has, she has bought a solar panel for her house. Now there's rural like electrification in her home. And this, has, this is a woman who used to cut girls. Now she has, she's not cutting girls. She's now becoming a change agent. She's speaking out to other communities. And even when you're having those community dialogues, we tell them you're the ones to drive these conversations. You're the ones to speak to the people as we're just going to guide you. So yeah, many, many achievements have happened, uh, including uh, reconciling the rescued girls to their family so that we can ease in the reintegration process. Uh, normally, when girls are rescued, we just take them back home and we do not follow up. So we realize it's good to follow up with these girls and have some form of mentorship. At least every member of Narating Toye to have at least two mentees in, who are rescued from these harmful cultural practices so that there's continuous mentorship. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how have you been able to bridge the gap between the old and the millennials in regards to FGM? How do you do you ensure that they come together to ensure that, yes, they obey the cultural practices and abandon the harmful practices? Yeah, um, we realized uh, having intergenerational dialogues mm -hmm. is very important. And normally when you are doing those community dialogues, we separate them. We involve everyone. We, men are separated from women because in the Maasai culture, the Morans do not want to interact with the women. So even when you're having those talks, it's the young people who actually talk to their parents. And they, I, I'm very fortunate to be working in a community setting where they value our, our, our inputs, they value our opinions, they would like us working together with them. So I would just say uh, the intergenerational dialogue has really helped to ease the campaigns on ending harmful cultural practices. Yeah, okay. Um, what uh, interventions do you have or any mode of campaigns do you use to ensure that you reach even people who are not um, close by or maybe who have tough terrains or separated by the geographical areas? Uh, uh, where we are based like in Rombo, there's, there's tough terrain, uh, the roads are impassable but we cannot like rely so heavily on social media. In as far as we do social media campaigns, we prefer to take our campaigns down there in the, in, the, in the community setting. And at the same time, use local radios to campaign against harmful cultural practices. All right. Um, what negative or what challenges have you encountered in, in initiating your campaigns on the ground? The challenges are very minimal. I cannot say they, they are, they are, they are that much. At first, I could experience backlash from my own community mm -hmm. because you know you cannot ambush your community with matters FGM. This is something they've been doing all this time. But once you've decided you will just work with this same group of people, 
the challenges will become uh, will will only be coming from your end. Mm. In fact, I always feel like it's the youth, us as young people, we are the ones who are not that committed. We are the ones who are derailing these campaigns, and especially amongst stakeholders, there's unnecessary co competition that makes it very hard for us to collaborate and make things happen. Um, you mentioned about an issue with the administration. So how, what are you doing to ensure that you are at par with the administration in order to support campaigns against FGM? Yeah, the, the local administration first, we have to inform them that we are going to come and we have to invite them uh, when we are, we are planning our calendar of activities so that they feel like they are really important in these campaigns. You know, when you involve them, even prior to your visit, they'll, they'll feel very, very valued and they will be able to work with you. Okay, um, in these engagements that you conduct at the grassroots level, how well do you involve the religious leaders? I'll be very honest. Um, in the Maasai setting, religion is something very new. Mm -hmm. uh, we rarely involve those religious leaders, but m almost 90% of our community engagements, we do it in a church, in the Catholic church in Rombo Mission. And we have to inform the catechist and the priest, so long as we are not talking about family planning, because that is their, their criteria. You do not have to talk about family planning in our church, but when we are, we, are, we are with them, it's just going to be easy for us. Okay. Do you have like any stories of stereotypes of victimization for girls who have not been cut? And how are you bridging that issue? Um, most of the time, uh, it's the, uh, because we normally have those uh, workshops during the school holidays, that's in April, August, and December. And we keep encouraging our girls and telling them that they should not feel pressured to go through FGM. Mm -hmm. They should not think about who will marry them, who will not marry them. It's not the time to think about marriage. It's the time to think about prospering and becoming important people. Of course, girls will tell us that they are stigmatized in school, mm -hmm. that they, are, they do not have friends. But I keep telling them that the friends you, are, you want to have right now, you, they will not be your friends in the next 10 years. So that pressure of fitting in should, should be a, a notion of the past. All right. Um, I will introduce the next uh, speaker, who will be Harrison. Hello, guys. Can we proceed, Harrison? Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, yeah, Ms. Harson. Can you hear me? Kindly introduce yourself uh, okay. and the work that you do on the ground. And then you can give us the social changes that have been able to happen uh, at your place. Okay, my, name's, uh, <clears throat> my name is Harrison De Kerio. I'm a male champion of the Kipia County. Uh, um, I joined uh, this fight against FGM last year. So um, optimistic, and I'm, I'm having some problems with my internet, but I think you people can hear me. Am I am I fine? I'm sorry. Sorry. Seems. Can you hear me? Kindly proceed. Yes, kindly proceed. Okay, so I was saying that my name is Harrison Lekerio and I am a male champion from Lake Ipia County. I've been, uh, I've been uh, championing against uh, the fight against the GM, child marriages and other form of gender-based violence in my county uh, for like one year currently. I've been working closely with uh, my colleagues, Masharia, who is the head of the uh, youth and TFGM Network Kenya. And uh, I've had so many activities in the course of last year, towards the end of December, and so many other activities that I've been attending. So uh, kindly, you can ask me the question again. I think I'll be... Right. Okay, so the first question will go, um, how important is it to involve men? Forms 
on FGM? I would like to say that uh, we are the head of the, our household. We are the people who make decisions in our households and uh, men are very important in this fight against the FGM. And I believe uh, I've attended a training when, uh, male and FGM champion training. I attended one in Isiolo and uh, we were able to highlight some of the most important parts, especially that we men play in this this fight. The first one is that uh, once probably I myself in my household, I say that uh, from today, I want to be able to let my kid go through this uh, violence, this act. Nobody will question that. Another thing is that we also have uh, like uh, probably resources and we can be able to have that mobility and uh, especially in our terrain, you can be able to move from one village to another, trying to use so many other means you can be able to mobilize elders and other youth, uh, other men to be able to join the fight. And that's something that I've uh, been able to achieve after I went to a training in Isiolo. Next question. All right. Um, what, what, what major campaigns have you been able to do with men and boys in your community? The main... Uh, uh, the main uh, activities that I've been able to do uh, was mainly community dialogues uh, with my uh, religious leaders. There was a function that I had three days and I've also as well been moving from one village to another, especially in a place known as Mogodo Eastward. That's where I come from. So I was able to mobilize so many boys and uh, uh, elders and we are optimistic that probably we will have a, a elder ceremony blessing. And this one, uh, it's something that we are just optimistic that it will be able to break a curse, something that most of our, our community set up fear. And that's some of the challenges that which has made them uh, go, uh, which has made the girls to undergo FGM because they fear how will, if I don't undergo FGM, how will the elders react? Would this thing come into my marriage? and? Uh, probably cause so many problems. So that's something that I'm optimistic that probably this year, I was planning to have a, like a head of family blessings involving uh, elders and uh, community, I mean, and religious leaders. Okay, uh, I will proceed to the next question. Yeah. How can we influence change and implementation of reforms at grassroots levels? The main thing that we can be able to use to uh, implement change in our grassroots level, to my, me, myself, uh, in my own thinking, I think is involving uh, the, uh, not only chiefs, but we also have to involve uh, our uh, community setup. You know, we, also, we have our Nyumbakumi, which I know we have been told that they have been involved, but we have to make sure that it's working. We have to try and bring in the law and uh, try to just incorporate so many things together and see which best uh, and I'm optimistic that when you involve in Mbakumi, we involve uh, our religious leaders, we involve our elders and uh, just let them bless the, 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 those girls who have not undergone FGM because uh, in my own thinking I think that 70% of um, the solution to FGM, especially in my community setup, is cultural. So if you involve the the um, um, uh, the elders, I believe that we we'll have uh, a significant change in some years to come. All right. Um, what positive impact has it created uh, aside from carrying out the campaign? What positive in, uh, impact has it created in the society in regards to men championing for uh, the anti-FGM campaigns? Um, the positive impact that I myself can be able to see is that I've seen men, uh, my fellow men, uh, saying that I won't let my daughter undergo FGM. That's the first step. The other thing is that I've seen my fellow young men joining me in this fight. And uh, that's a significant change, considering that back in the years, nobody could have been 
uh, nobody could even wish to be associated with this thing because they believe that probably the community will uh, be able to have quite a, a negative impact, a negative thinking about you. So I'm seeing some significant changes. And uh, I've also seen uh, so many young girls who, are, uh, who have not undergone FGM. And back in the days, this used to be something that someone has to undergo. Um, and to my last question, um, what challenges have you experienced in regards to carrying out campaigns? Yeah, challenges are there. Uh, one of the main challenges is that probably I want to have a, a, I want to cover a larger area. I want to visit so many other villages. I want to probably make a, an impact. Or probably I want to end it by 2022, as the president was saying, as in. Yeah, but the major challenge is sometimes we have shortages of fund and you understand the welfare, you have to, at least as much as you will be involving them, there is, there is need for transportation, there is need for their welfare or something small uh, that they can be able to drink or uh, stuff like that. And another major challenge as well is that the fact that sometimes you get some branding names and some people might, you know, in this fight sometimes you have to sacrifice yourself and just uh, do it to your level best. But you like meet some people who will be branding your names, telling you that this is not something that men should be doing. This is something for women. This is something that, uh, what does it concern you for you to talk about something that which is, which you don't even know how it feels. So those are some of the challenges among many others. Okay, um... Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, to, to my very last question from you, what can men FGM champions do to sensitize other men to join the campaign, especially in other regions? The, my, according to me, I will go with in line with what men and FGM uh, are doing. And uh, I think the main thing is first of all, the training. Because before I start to join the fight, I need to understand. What is this FGM? How is it affecting our young girls and our mothers and our small sisters? So the main thing that I believe is training. Another thing is that probably like just the way men and FGM are doing in counties, every other. And then the men who will be trained, they, they should go again. They should as well be facilitated so that they can be able to train some other uh, young men in probably villages or in a, a some some let's say probably in, in a constituency or in a ward setup, and I believe that through that we'll be able to reach uh, quite a many young men. All right, thank you very much, Harrison. And so we'll be going to our next session, uh, and I will highlight some of the reports uh, and statements that have been mentioned. In that, F, um, in that FGM happens to girls every day, everywhere, with millions remaining silent, yet there are survivors who refuse to be defined by their traumas, giving hope to other survivors to tell their stories. Stay tuned for a short documentary that will be premiered on 5th, on 5th of February. And here is a sneak peek. My name, My name is Sadia Hussein, I'm an LFGM champion and a women rights activist from Tana River County. My personal story began when I was 10 years old. I was cut at the age of 10. I was shocked to see a razor blade and I didn't have that time to ask questions. three daughters who have never gone through FGM and um, it was really challenging for me to be campaigning against a culture that was believed to be a social norm something that people really really valued so much 
So there was a lot of resistance in my community and some even thought I was betraying my own culture, but I never gave up because I had to protect my own daughters. Mimi ni champion wa kuende game kwa sababu nimeona hii mila ya kiketaji ni mbaya. Wasichana wana kiketo vibaya. Religion has been brought in wrongly into this to support this practice. And every religious leader knows that we have a duty to forbid what is evil. FGM is evil because it is harmful to the girl child. When you see a survivor, you will see the smile on her face. But unless she confesses to you and tells you her story, you cannot sympathize with her simply because the scars are hidden. And that's what we need to understand, all of us.
uh, not cutting girls and uh, there are even girls who have not been cut uh, at uh, community levels who have succeeded very much. So, and they come from families where they are men. So when such men speak and they are associated with so and so uh, doubt, it makes other men uh, understand the reason of uh, not cutting girls. Okay, thank you, Elias. And from where you're coming from, uh, is there a gap between you guys who are dealing with the, the anti-FGM campaigns and those that are still supporting the campaigns? How are you bridging that gap to ensure that every man is at power with whatever you're doing? Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we conduct training on gender transformation because um, you these people are, are, are brought in a, in, in a community where there are cultural practices which are, are, are believed to be true. Uh, they are, there are behaviors, there are attributes, um, there are roles, activities, and responsibilities um, which um, are done by, 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 by a certain group. So you find that the, what we do is to train them to have dialogues on gender transformation because uh, we believe that to transform other people, you have to be transformed first. Uh, and also uh, after we take them through activities on gender transformation, uh, we take them through activities of enabling change, of enabling them to change because these are new concepts to them. Uh, they have been practicing FGM for a long time. This is their practice, their cultural thing, and they are used to that. So it's not easy. You cannot change a certain culture uh, or practice in a day or two or a month. So you have to take them through activities on gender transformation. So that at least they can start embracing new ideas. Uh, they can start thinking about uh, their roles, their responsibilities, and how now they can start changing. So from gender transformation, we go to enabling change. So that now we can enable them change. So that as they go out to speak to, to their families, to speak to the community, they have themselves changed. Now, after uh, taking them through the activities for enabling themselves to change, uh, we take them through now what we call facilitating the change process. Because now they have uh, transformed, at least they, they have changed themselves. And now they can now speak to their families. They can speak to their workmates. They can speak to their fellow members of the community uh, in a way that is convincing them to, to, to change. And then we also teach them some aspects of communication because you, you may be invited in a certain baraza, chief's baraza, some of the men are leaders in churches, how they package and deliver their messages, especially when they are talking to their fellow men and uh, fellow elders. I, after we take them through that process, um, we now release them to go to work and we have seen tremendous changes. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, very many positive results. Uh, we have seen men mobilizing other men to speak against the effects, uh, to speak against, to speak about effects of FGM and uh, child marriages. And the process um, continues. At least if someone is changed in a group of 20, even if you change to, at least they will change others. Um, okay. Um... Kindly, kindly expound on the challenges that you face on a daily basis while, while you are carrying out your campaigns. Uh, challenges uh, w which uh, we face first, the ch uh, first challenges about the, the cultural beliefs. Uh, you, 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 everywhere you go, you, you'll be told this is our culture, this is what we do. So that is one of the challenges. And another one is what, what I call um, religious fundamentalism, because you realize that some of the practices um, uh, like FGM, they say it is a religious practice, especially in Muslim communities. So unless now you have a, a religious scholar who will expound on such thing, because especially when you are working, in, when you have sessions with the, with the Muslim community and you are not a Muslim, you, you don't know about the Quran, there is no way you can convince them because they will not uh, uh, accept what you say, but we in, in such forums, we usually have um, uh, religious leaders. We have sheikhs who, who, who talk about uh, uh, the stand of uh, the Quran on FGM. Uh, 
So the two cultural beliefs and religious fundamentalism are the key uh, challenges we face. How do you deal with stigma and victimization on children? Um, we, uh, as uh, a network, we have what we call, uh, we embraced a program we call Dads and Daughters uh, Workshops, where we brought in dads and daughters together uh, uh, for a forum. We, 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 do, we did it because we wanted to impress communication between dads and daughters. Because in most of the African setting, you, found that, you find that dads are reserved for, daughters are reserved for, for, for mothers and the sons, uh, the fathers. So, so that we can initiate communication between dads and, and, and daughters, um, we uh, developed a program where we had dads um, and their daughters, the one aged between nine to uh, 17 years, they came together in a forum. And then um, the thing we did first is introduction. We, we encouraged the dads to introduce their daughters and the daughters to introduce their dads, at least so that at least we, we can have uh, the aspect of communication. And then we also gave them assignments to do together. And we also had, um, uh, we, 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 we had selfies for each dad and the daughter and some posters where they could hang in their houses with some messages. So that is a way of um, uh, bringing dads that, that, that closer to their daughters so that at least they can, have, uh, they can avoid the stigma, maybe at home. And also we, we, we have community dialogues on acceptance of girls who have not been cut so that they are not discriminated as a community. They are not um, um, abused and they are given certain roles to perform because sometimes you find if a girl is not cut, maybe she cannot perform some roles, but we engage uh, the dads, the men on through dialogue on the best way they can uh, work with their daughters. to you, Elias, is what can men FGM champions do to sensitize other men to join the campaign? Um, what can be done is, first of all, community engagement through community change agents. We have trained community change agents at community level. These are members of the community who, who, are, who are there, especially teachers, religious leaders, so they can capitalize on the opportunity they have in community barazas, in churches, where they have positions to speak uh, against uh, FGM. We, through uh, men at FGM, we had, uh, we trained male champions uh, who, who always go back to the community to, sp to speak against FGM. We also train religious and traditional leaders uh, to promote behavior change and challenge cultural belief beliefs surrounding FGM. Also, what can be done is uh, building a strong uh, national multi sector network, knowledge sharing hub. Uh, because you find that everyone is working alone at, in a particular place. But if we join hands together, we look at um, the strategies we use and we ask ourselves whether they are working or not, uh, it is good. Uh, so that now we can review what works and what does not work. And then we, we, we join forces together and we work on that at the community level. We also need to use, uh, as, a, as a network, we use... Uh, the rapidly expanding communication technology because technology is very important uh, to enhance uh, uh, anonymous reporting of FGM uh, plans or incidents because sometimes you can endanger yourself if you are reporting cases of FGM. So uh, because we have um, uh, technology which is uh, high tech, um, we can use that. We can also, like now during the COVID time, um, it is now an opportunity to use uh, that technology also to pass messages, to communicate on uh, the effects of FGM, on the emerging trends of FGM uh, to our young people, because uh, you find that young people are very much in technology. So we, can, we should use the power of uh, technology so that at least we can pass uh, messages surrounding FGM. Uh, thank you so much, Elias. Um, kindly, is Kate online? Hello, Kate. Hello, Kate. Kate, are you there? 
Oh, well, now, now we'll open the, we'll go to the interac uh, interactive session where we'll be, everyone will be tasked to speak on the campaigns that you've been carrying out, especially during this particular period of the pandemic. I will start off with Matilda. Kindly let us know what you've been doing on the ground and what you've been covering for everyone to understand and maybe what we should do more. Thank you. Uh, as narrating to you, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we did a documentation with uh, just a brief report. We went out there and collected some information from schools mm -hmm. and found out that because that in 2020, the year was very hot. The earth, we recorded the hottest year in the earth. And the, with the climate change and hunger crisis, families are now marrying off their children in exchange of livestock so that now they can be able to sustain their, their livelihoods. So we decided now we are going to be doing food distribution. We'll be actually doing one food re distribution, food re relief, this this uh, International Day for Zero Tolerance to Ending FGM, that's on Saturday. We are going to be going to Mosiro to help a school there that has once, that it once shut down due to lack of food in the school. And during last, last year, we also distributed food. We distributed dignity kits to girls because we found out now that with the curfew, with the measures and regulations, families were unable to even meet the needs of the feminine needs of their girls. Yeah. Um, I'll throw back the question to Harris. Harrison, sorry. Harrison. Okay, I'll move on to Kate. Okay. Um, hello, Kate. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hey. Welcome on board. So uh, can you uh, kindly tell us uh, what changes have been happening, especially uh, since uh, the demise of Jelida. Have you made any progress on campaigns against FGM or what has been happening? Kindly unmute yourself, Kate. Hello. Hello, Kit, are you there? Hello. Yes. yes. Okay, kindly proceed. Okay. Hi. We can My name you, is Kate. Catherine Diakono. Okay, my name is Catherine Diakono uh, from Meru County. Oh, you've asked about the, the progress we have been since uh, the last time maybe we had a campaign in Meru County. Uh, through that campaign, people were, uh, were able to know, or we, they were able to get a message that FGM happens in Meru County. It was like an opening door to the world and the country that FGM happens in Meru County. One of the things we have done through partnership with the uh, MENED FGM, which we are members, we went ahead to train a Meru champion in Meru County, that was our first, our first meeting we did. We have been uh, training communities and sensitizing them about FGM. That is one of the things we have been doing. Training both uh, elders, the during check -in, who have been uh, a key, who are key, they play a very key role in the community since they are among the decision makers and they are, they are like, the careers of our culture. So that is one of the things we will be doing. Um, okay, Kate. Um, so what? Uh, how? How are those people who used to cut or are still cutting girls receiving the campaigns against FGM in your communities? Okay, one of the things that we can we have noted some changes because we have been receiving uh, phone calls report that uh, before even the cut takes place. The people for the first time in Meru County, or in Igembe, because Meru is big, there's only one part of Meru County where FGM is carried. That is the Nyambene region. That is Tigania and Igembe. 
and some part of Meru Central. So not all part of Meru where FGM is. is. Uh, people have embraced the message of ending FGM where you find the community by itself they may report a case before it happens. Or even we have, we have seen a lot of arrests of people who have undergone FGM, especially because it is so peculiar in Meru where you find, okay, I've had, uh, I think in Pokote and Baringo, where you find that uh, they are circumcising mature women or married women and even their children. So through our campaign, we have had them, FGM has no benefit for them to embrace education and uh, other activities to build the community. Okay, um, I will move to the next person who is Harrison. Um, Harrison, could you explain to us um, the campaigns that you've been conducting, especially during this tough period of the pandemic, and has the situation escalated or reduced in your case? Okay, I would like Harrison? to say that. Uh, hello? I would like to say that uh, we conducted some campaigns uh, during the COVID-19 period, but unfortunately we were limited. So I only had like two functions, uh, like uh, two functions, although the two of them were like one week. So I approximately during the pandemic period, towards the end of last year, that's when I had some functions. And uh, it involved, it involved uh, religious leaders uh, from my community. Uh, uh, cultural elders and uh, youth, both young and at least uh, I was even able to bring some very young girls who are in primary school, as an, I consider that those are the people who, who, are, the, who, who are at the risk of undergoing FGM. And uh, one of the main things that I was able to get through that is that I was able to know where are we in especially in my community where I come from, where are we in this fight against FGM? And uh, um, like Ipe County, most of the time, uh, there are very few uh, community engagement like this, which have been contacted. And I was just able to meet uh, very few activists. So, and uh, the FGM in this area is quite high. And the main thing is because people, the literacy, the, the literacy level is low. So I can be able to say that then if I try to uh, measure the success of the community engagement they was able to have, I would say that uh, it was something that which was able to spark a discussion and uh, I had quite a very interactive session and I had uh, the youth at the FGM network together with uh, the anti-FGM board representative and it was a very good forum for us. So, Okay, what are the statistics, especially during this pandemic? I would like to say that uh, though I was not able to have the, you know, you cannot have the actual data, probably, but I can say that the FGM is still there and uh, it's still uh, closely to, I can say 70 to 80% there. It's only that it's done, uh, it's, not, it's not like a ceremony as it used to be, we used to, have ceremonies, dancing and partying and feasting. These days they, they will just be done by people in that household. Uh, the lady who will have undergone that FGM will be just dressing in the normal clothes. We used to have a special clothes that people used to wear. These days they don't wear those clothes and they will be given some very simple tasks like uh, just washing utensils and uh, just uh, cleaning the house and doing some small things that probably even if you visit the home, it will be hard for you to be able to know if something has uh, happened there. Even if you are alerted, if you, you know you cannot do screening definitely. Even if you are alerted and you visit the place, it will be quite hard. And that has been the major challenge here. So to me, what I believe is that the first thing is that we have to change the mindset of the people, that we are able to show them the effect of FGM as per se, because some of them are saying that you are telling us uh, FGM has effects and uh, our generation and uh, we have been doing this for generation and generations. So to me, I am optimistic and I have hope and uh, 
I know when it will be a time that my my age mates will be the people we have, uh, young daughters. I believe that at least we have access to social media and so many other things. And by then, I believe that FGM will, uh, will come to an end. I have hope. Yeah. Okay, I'll move on to Matilda. Um, kindly, perhaps if you, if you are able, you give us statistics on FGM during the COVID period and what you have been doing to ensure that these girls don't um, keep on being cut. Uh, with, the with the statistics, I, I cannot have the real, real, the updated statistics, uh, but I keep, uh, I keep checking the statistics from the UNICEF. And now we, have, we are told in Kajado County, we've gone down to 76%. But again, with the recent survey that, that was just released by the Department of Health, it shows Kajado is going up with HIV prevalence. And where we are working in, uh, in Rombo, it's actually FGM and women giving birth at home that has increased the HIV prevalence. So one of the activities we've been doing during the COVID pandemic and right now is having the, the girl, girl mentorship programs, the girl workshops because we need to really be in touch with the girls and especially because the rescue centers were closed and girls had to be reintegrated to their, fami to, to their families. We still have that fear that they should not be, be cut or be married off. So we need to keep in touch with them. We've been keeping in touch with them. We've been having the reconciliation with their families, contacting their families and making sure that the girls are safe. And we are, we're also telling parents to keep their girls in school that girls should continue, they should transition to higher learning without interruptions. Have you had any circumstances where that you were unable to reach these girls or the parents were not coordinating? Not really. Uh, I think one, one of the reasons why we've not had such a challenge is because we are, we've also put the parents in our community outreach programs. So they are part of our programs, they are working with us directly. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Kate, are you there? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, kindly let us know about what has been happening during this period of the pandemic um, in Meru County and what have you been doing to ensure that girls uh, are, not, are not still being cut? Since we okay, had the lockdown in place and we still had the restriction of movement from, count, from different counties, yeah. But one thing, one thing we have noted, there has been increased number of FGM during this uh, lockdown time, whereby you find uh, parents are doing it behind doors. And this one has been uh, escalated because of the culture. I can say there, in my community, one thing we have noted, people bringing back the culture. Okay, our culture. Our culture is not bad, but you find many a times the culture which was practiced by my grandfather is not uh, viable at this age. So you find, for instance, what has contributed is uh, the male circumcision, the tradition male circumcision. The way it is being done, they are following the, the whole culture, pra cultural practices, like where a woman is not supposed to, like, to take care of the circumcised boy if the woman is not circumcised. So because of this, you find the cases have gone higher, even for the married women who have sons, they have first of all to go and uh, be circumcised in order to come and take care of some few cases which we have noted. Male circumcision, you find small girls have, have gone and have been circumcised. Okay. So we have faced a lot of challenges during this Corona COVID-19 period. And some of the things we have done, we have been following up with our champion. For instance, the people we have trained, because most of the time you cannot reach the whole region or uh, home to home. There are those people we have trained, we call them champions. And these champions, at least they have been uh, uh, they have been in touch with the with the with the with the with the people, and now they can train them about the effect of FGM. 
So we have been in touch through through our champion. That is what I can say. But cases have gone higher. That is, that is something which should be noted. The reason why you find cases have gone higher in Meru County is because they are no, they are, like you find in other areas where they practice, there are so many organizations which are fighting or they are, they are, they are fighting the vice. But in Meru County, especially in my region, that is uh, the Nyambene region, you may find there are like three to four organizations which are known. And the population is very high, the area to be covered is very high. So th that is one of the challenges we have faced. But we can see the messages. So, and we have seen uh, some improvement because of the charge. Because during our training, we have been including even the pastors who are who reach a bigger congregation. And they, as you know, the, the pastors are believed in the community. I mean, they, are, they have a big follow up of their congregation, and they, are, they have been passing the, the same message to the congregation. Yeah, that's what I can Thank you, Kate. Uh, I would like to pose this question to you again. How have you been working with the county government and the national government and other NGOs to ensure you put an end uh, on FGM? Okay, when we have been working with the county government, the county okay, launched, uh, uh, what are they called? They launched the, the, the gender, the gender, the gender, the gender law in, in Meru County. That is one way we can say. Uh, the national government, oh, okay. They have been supporting us, the anti-FGM board, through some of our training, like the training we had in Meru County. That is how. So when it comes to other NGOs, Mary is, is in its, its, its own class because there are no those international or national NGOs in Meru who fight the FGM. Like the big organization, you not find them in Meru. The last time we had an organization in Meru speaking about FGM was Plan International. That was back in '90s, and the moment they, they, they like they, their contract or their term, their tenure in Meru was finished. They went, and now no other co, 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 I mean, no other organization has ever come in Meru County. So that is one of the challenges we have. We have in Meru County, there are no international or national NGOs. So you find that. If it is to do, we rely on churches, we rely on the on our community to do the work. Now, now and that, now it happens that when the when the, the plan international pulled pulled uh, from Meru County, with the time FGM uh, F, FGM statistics had gone down, and now with the time the, the cases are rising. So that is, that is another challenge we have in Meru County. Um, okay, I will move to Elias. Kindly explain to us how you've been working with the government, that is the national government and the county government, uh, against FGM. Uh, against FGM. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, during Elias? that, uh, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes. Hear me? yes, I can. All right, during the COVID time period, we what we did we conducted uh, the dads and daughters workshop because we found it necessary because uh, girls were in, uh, at home, they were not in school. So we, we made the sure that uh, we have the dads uh, uh, and because of restrictions of the numbers, we brought in 10 dads and uh, 10 daughters and then we had sessions with them because we wanted them to bond, to enhance our communication because that time it was very risky and uh, girls could be cut in time and could be married off in time because they are not in school. So we thought that um, in our discussion, we'll uh, discuss and dialogue with the dads so that they can protect the girls from the cut and um, from uh, early marriages. And it worked because um, we also had chiefs, um, representatives of the national government in our in, in our workshops we had also representatives from the county government who came with their daughters also um 
uh, and we, we we had discussions with them. Unfortunately, um, not unfortunately, but fortunately, well, because we were working in 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 Migori, uh, the dads who attended the, the chiefs and uh, their assist assistants who attended our workshops were not uh, interdicted. <laughs> Uh, they were not of the ten who were interdicted that time uh, in uh, uh, in November uh, when the, the national government cracked the whip. Uh, we also had teachers, so at least we made sure that we have the focal people um, from the community level. We have the chiefs, assistant chiefs, the teachers, the representatives from the county government. We also we also had um, religious leaders uh, and also uh, traditional leaders in the in the workshops, that least they can pass the message to their peers. And also one thing we did is that they we, they formed fathers groups, at least so that they can monitor uh, their peers. That is the, one of the key things we left because we asked them now, or we discussed with them the way forward and they said, we said, they said that we'll form fathers groups where we'll be checking on each other, where we'll be monitoring each other. If one person, uh, one of our members, uh, uh, Marisa Adouta Hali will uh, meet him and reprimand him and take the necessary steps that leads the good work and continue. So that's um, that's how we worked with the, the national and the county government. Uh, okay, I'll proceed to Harrison. Harrison, how have you been working with the government and the the national government and the county government and also the NGOs towards campaign against FGM? I would like to say that uh, we have been working closely with the, uh, the uh, government and those ones who are in uh, power, but unfortunately I was not able to probably meet the county commissioner for those people, but I was able to work with the chiefs and uh, just uh, the, the main, uh, my main target is usually the chiefs because I like doing my uh, community dialogues and awareness in villages. So most of the time I involve the chiefs and uh, just any other leaders. Most of the time, uh, there was a time uh, during the International Youth Day, uh, I also had, uh, I also had uh, our MCA who said that he will support us. But uh, during that day, we had so many issues that we are dealing with, the teen pregnancies. But uh, as we all know, we have a challenge. Politicians don't want to get involved with the FGM issue because they you know that they lose. Uh, they think that they when they get involved to FGM, they lose votes, and probably they would be reelected in the year 2022. So that's the major challenge, and you understand that as well in your side. So, but at least I try to incorporate so many other things and probably bring issues to do with that. Uh, teen pregnancies, and you know when the government was stressing on uh, the uh, those in power, that those people are leading us to get involved and try how they can be able to solve. I was able to bring them in. The main issue was teen pregnancies, but I have to bring FGM as well. So that's how I was able to involve them. Yeah. Any question? Okay, I'll, I will go on to Matilda. What messages do you have ahead of the International Day of Zero Tolerance to FGM? Uh, my message uh, on that day is to all girls, uh, please speak up, speak out, and stand up against all forms of gender-based violence. Do not feel pressured to fit in. Do not go out there wanting to get uh, cut or mutilated. So that you can please anybody. Always have self-defense. Be ready to say no when you don't want it. And to the parents out there, please have some form of parental responsibility. Do not neglect your rules. Take your children to school. Support them where you, you can. We don't want them to be supported by people who have ill motives. Yeah. Um, I will move to Kate. Kate, uh, what message do you have ahead of the International Day? of zero tolerance to FGM. Okay. 
Kate, kindly unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, kindly proceed. Okay, well, the message I have to the to the parent is that let them play their role as parent. They they protect their children. To the father, they are they are the end of the family. They are the fathers to both girls and boys. They protect them from pedophiles, from FGM, because most of the time we have during our training of men and FGM. We have had men saying FGM is an issue of the women. It is a women thing. But I will urge men to take to take charge of their families because we keep on asking them, them who keep cows, them, for instance, people from my community who have a crop like Mira, we talk about, we ask them, how many times have you found your wife has sold your your lad or your your cows or something like that, or you even your mirror plantation, they have sold them. How many times have you kept quiet? It, most of these men, they will tell them, they will tell you it has never happened. But now we ask them between the property and the girls, who is more valuable? You take charge of these properties, but not your girls. So a message they have to the dance, to the men in our community, let them be the men they are when it comes to other matters. They protect their girls. Uh, concerning to the to the to the to the community, to everyone, let us protect children. Children have no voice. As as adults, we are the voice of these children. And as we protect these children from FGM, from all form of uh, abuse, we are protecting the next generation. The only way we can build a, the, a good, uh, I mean, the next generation is instilling the right values in them and is taking care of them. That's the, my message to them, to everyone. Thank you very much, Kate. I will move to Harrison. What message do you have ahead of the International Day of Zero Tolerance to FGM? Uh, I will say that uh, my message. I will try. I will. I will. I'm also in line with the uh, what UNICEF have, or the what UNICEF and other UN agencies have. They are saying that there is no time for global inaction, unite fund act, and end FGM. But my case is quite different. I will say that my message uh, to everyone who is in this fight. I know. Sometimes it gets hot, sometimes you have to have the hardware or rather the willingness to do it yourself. You have to sacrifice and uh, probably uh, just do it to your level best. That's what I would like to say. And my final word is we need to involve different stakeholders in the fight against FGM. Like now, the way we have come today, we have Mtoto News, we have Men and FGM, uh, we have uh, Youth and FGM Network, our representatives. I, will, I believe that when uh, so many CBOs, so many NGOs and uh, different stakeholders come together, we'll have the power, we'll have the ability to be able to push this fight further. And uh, I think that's my, those are my words. Okay, I, I, I will move on to Elias. What message do you have ahead of the International Day of Zero, Zero Tolerance to FGM? Thank you so much. Um, what the message that I have is to request um, the dads to promote girls' education just as they do to their sons so that they can empower them um, uh, economically. We also think, we want to think of um, also empowering girls to be active decision makers at the community level, because you find that uh, maybe girls have not, uh, do not make decisions uh, on, in, in terms of their, their health, in terms of their life, but we need to empower them as parents, as members of the community. Let us empower our girls because they are powerful. They can achieve more. They can be powerful people. Let us give them the opportunity 
if the same opportunity we give to boys, let us give uh, girls the same opportunities so that they can pursue their dreams, they can pursue their passions in life, and we'll have a cohesive society which is free from all forms of violence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Elias. And before we end this session or we give our last remarks, I will open the floor for questions. Any questions or if the panelists would, would like to ask questions. Bahati? Bahati, we can see you are, you raised your hand. Bahati, are you on board? Hello. Bahati, kindly unmute yourself. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, kindly proceed. Oh, uh, I had read this. Oh, uh, I would like to say hello to everybody. And indeed, it's a very insightful discussion that we are having this evening. And uh, I've already had some of the programs in place, at least to help those who have already not been affected with the same. But uh, my wish will also be. Uh, I would like to know maybe whether there's anything in place for those who have already been affected with the same. Uh, maybe because uh, many of these programs of FGM, they have been in place at least, and they have become a little bit um, more vibrant and aggressive like for the last two decades. But so many people had been initially affected with the same and they could be living with the scars do we have any program which can help them to even emotionally recover and even get economically empowered or even get empowered in every aspect of their life so that they can also lead a very healthy life? Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Bahati. Any one of our panelists would like to give any remarks? Matilda? On that question. Yeah, on that question. Whatever Bahati was asking about. Yeah, proceed. Uh, as Nadia Tintoye, we've been tasked uh, to identify survivors of violence. And we will be identifying uh, the, the people who've gone through all forms of violence and having a database and then reporting it to the Collaborative Center for Gender and Development, which is an NGO that has partnered with us so that we can create synergies as young people for a gender mainstreaming process. So in case you, you know of anyone who is at risk or anyone who has undergone any form of violence, please let us know as narrating to you. And so long as they come from Kajadu County, we are going to link them directly through to CCGD because CCGD is supporting them through an economic strengthening program. Um, I will still throw it um, to Elias. Maybe you could respond back to Bahati. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Currently, uh, we don't have uh, uh, programs that target uh, victims uh, in um, of FGM, but we have a program that uh, uh, addresses the plight of windows in um, in Makueni County, where we have a, a pottery and beekeeping project for around 50 widows. These two experienced violence in, the, in their lives. They came together and registered a group and through uh, funding from one of the organizations in the US, and we started a uh, poultry and beekeeping project at least to empower them economically and it's doing very well. We have not expanded it to other parts of the country uh, or mm, 
we have done not done to, so to FGM victims, but in case of uh, anything, I think um, that comes up. Uh, I think I can reach to Total News or uh, so that at least you can follow up with our uh, with that. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will proceed to Kate. You respond to Bahati's question. As KIOS provider, we do have such a project, but anyone okay, from Mary Council? Hello. Yeah, kindly proceed. You can, you can hear me. Uh, we don't have any program of, of of sort, but uh, we know of our partners in uh, Meru County, based in uh, areas of Egembe. We have uh, uh, an organization which deals with uh, with uh, widows. It is called Mjane. So anyone from that area, we can connect with them. They are in a better position to to work with them. But in case of survivors or people. We can we can refer them to areas where they they can they are they are often uh, psychological support. Uh, there is a there is an organization our partner where we refer those girls, especially the ones who have been circumcised. We have partners where we can refer them for for counseling and even uh, for safe houses there in Meru. Okay, uh, I will go to Harrison. Kindly respond to Bahati's question. Yeah, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, currently we don't have uh, we don't have uh, <clears throat> something that which is in place. But uh, what we usually do is that we ensure that uh, there's no stigma, there's no like stigmatization or other. We try to just teach the community that uh, there's no need for us to call uh, those ladies who have undergone FGM. You know, like in our community, we have branding names, like they are called uh, Ndava, Entua, and stuff like those. Uh, you see, uh, so that's that's the angle that currently, that's what I'm going to do right now with the uh, help of my other colleagues that we work with. At least the little that we can be able to do is just uh, try to ensure that the, the, those who have undergone FGM are not uh, victimized or that they are not uh, branded names. And that's the position that you are in currently. But we are op optimistic that in future we'll have more uh, be better programs that we should be able to empower them economically. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. So um, to our viewers and to everyone online and to you also Bahati, we have a hashtag that is going on. Um, hashtag from cut to hope and then we have the hashtag from FGM, uh, FG, sorry, hashtag FGM zero tolerance day 21. So those are the hashtags that you can be following. And we also have the premiere of the documentary that is supposed to air on 5th of February. And to my, very, any, any other question? Do we have any other question? Oh yeah, so the, the documentary will premiere at 5 p.m. on 5th of February on YouTube, at Mtuto News YouTube. Kindly be on the look. Yeah, and to the very last question that I will start with Matilda. What are your future plans in fighting against FGM in Kenya? Okay, um, yeah, we already started a, pro pro a project uh, dubbed as Fostering Sanity Transitions from Teenage to Adulthood. Uh, we already en engaged 35 girls last December. So we intend to select 10 girls from the 35 girls, the girls who proved to be very outspoken, very active. They will be, we'll be launching a girl-led movement in April. And the purpose of this girl-led movement is for these 10 girls to be out there to protect their girls, their peers in school, and have a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship with the other girls. So as narrating to you, we'll just be guiding them 
and training them on leadership skills and for them to be campaigning against FGM. Yeah. Thank you, Matilda. I will move on to Harrison. What are your future plans in fighting FGM? Oh, my, Harrison? Yeah, my future plans and something that I'm optimistic that I will be able to get uh, some enough funds to mobilize is that uh, I've, I'm, um, I've tried to look at so many aspects, especially in my community I come from. And I've seen that uh, the solution to this is cultural. So I'm optimistic that at least I will be able to have a, a cultural blessing or rather just a cultural blessing involving family heads, especially in Lake Ipia North, uh, because I can be or rather clans. Because if you try to use that approach, I believe that at least we'll have uh, something to build up on. And when I'll be doing my uh, reference point, and when I go to approach a family and they tell me that, you know, in our family, uh, somebody who has not undergone FGM is cast, at least I'll have something to say that, uh, you see, we are able to bless that one uh, involving the, uh, our community elders. And in fact, you know, as much as we have gone to the digital world and we have so many other beliefs, we have to keep it in our mind that uh, our community still believes that uh, something can happen to them if they don't undergo FGM. And so many girls, even if they are family or other members of their families, tell them uh, or rather defend them, they will use, they will find their own means to undergo FGM. I know we have had some of those cases where somebody or other very young girls goes to the, uh, is saying that she has to undergo FGM because she, she is fearing that probably she would get married or rather even if she gets married, uh, marriage would last long and stuff like that. I know you guys are aware of things to do with that. So my main thing is if I can be able at least to have a, uh, something like a, we say a family heads blessing or rather really uh, other elders blessing involving different clans especially in like if you know yeah that's something that I'm optimistic about okay thank you very much Harrison um finally can we proceed to Kate your future plans in fighting against FGM Kate, kindly unmute yourself. Hello, Kate. Kate, kindly unmute yourself. Hello. Kate, can you, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, kindly proceed. Okay, the plants I have are in Meru County, the Jurincheke, a very powerful council of elders. And uh, in 1956, they declared uh, they outlawed FGM in Meru County. And the same statement, they affirmed it uh, in 2009. But this their ones has not been followed in the community because if it has been followed, today we will not, we will not be talking about FGM in Meru County. So my future plan is to get uh, to train these elders so that they can uh, they can pass the same message to the community and we can like do a declaration once again to remind the community that FGM is still illegal in Meru County. Is, those are my plans. Okay, thank you, Kate. I will move on to Elias. What are your future plans in fighting against FGM? Thank you very much. I, at first, is community engagement. I know we have the laws, uh, but uh, the laws are not... Uh, uh, they are there, but uh, FGM is there. So I think we can use the carrot. In, we have the carrot which we can engage the communities through community dialogues and uh, we have the laws which is the stick. So 
before we go to the stick, I think we are, uh, as Menegage, we are um, planning now to use the carrot, which is community engagement through community dialogues on uh, ch challenging cultural beliefs surrounding FGM. Let us have dialogues, let us look at the effects of FGM, the importance of girls' education. Her, um, we, we intend to have champions to speak to, uh, to communities on their achievements, what, what, what they have um, achieved. We, have, uh, we, we, we want uh, survivors to speak about the, their experiences and the problems they have faced because of the cut. So that at least we can influence more community members to stop the cut. We also, I think the other thing is to build a strong um, national sector network um, uh, and knowledge sharing hub because we have a lot of information, but how do we pass it? Do we keep it? But let us all work together. It is, let us partner. Partnership is very important in this work. If um, organizations are working in a particular place, um, we are planning to look at the organization working in, this, uh, in a certain place, we work together. Look at what works and implement it at the community level. Because at least when we are divided, when everyone is pulling on his own side, uh, the message cannot be effective. But when we are working together, when we are passing the same message, uh, it helps so much uh, be because even um, the community members will, be, will see an organized team who knows what they are doing and believe that the message which is, which is being passed is the right message. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Elias. And thank you to everyone. Uh, or the premiere of the From Cuts to Hope documentary under the hashtag FGM Zero Tolerance Day 21 and also under the hashtag From Cuts to Hope kindly be on the lookout and kindly also join us at 5 p.m. for an, uh, the same webinar. Thank you very much for joining and thank you for coming through to join this initiative on ending FG. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you, thank you so much for hosting me and uh, thank you from Total News for such a, a very in, uh, engaging